Well, good morning and welcome to Still Growing in Grace, another great episode uh, ready for you today. Um, a couple weeks ago, we launched uh, broadcasting this program on the Grace Awakening Network, which is a 24-hour TV online station um, run through Roku uh, as a primary location for anyone around the world. I didn't realize that Roku was bigger than a cable TV idea, um, and it is. It's more accessible and everywhere available. So. Um, I don't have Roku, but once I found out that this was going to be available online as well through a web page, I went, okay, let's, let's jump on board. Uh, I was quite thrilled to do that, <clears throat> and the team that I'm working with uh, agreed. So a couple weeks ago, we launched uh, our first episode, and uh, as we were having that conversation, um, uh, I realized, let's, let's do this topic on hell because today we're going to talk about hell a better hope-filled perspective so this is a mini series that we're going to share with you we we did kind of launch it a couple weeks ago but i didn't realize that we'd be putting it on the gan or grace awakening network um and so we we're just restarting it now um and if you're watching it on the grace awakening network today's this morning the episode that i'm airing to you live uh is actually part two on gan i mixed it up it was supposed to been number one but it ended up being number two so it's correct in the correct order now right here so if you're gonna watch tonight you're seeing the exact same one um, but it airs every Wednesday night at 9 30 plus you can watch the um, uh, what do they call that on demand so the previous program so all you gotta do is go to the grace waking network you see all the links below um, you'll like that so I'm going to share with you what's being posted so I'm gonna do the short introduction into GAN that it's gonna be on the program and then right into the interview as we, we honestly have a very very amazing series on hell and all the tentacles that we have attached invisible and some visible on this concept we call hell um, we hardly ever question it I've had questions about this since I was a kid um, I had questioned um, how can this be uh, since I was a teenager um, but I was never allowed to really dig in and even when I went to Bible college they had like four or five different um, explanations for what hell could be and then they told you which one's right and which one's wrong so you didn't have to think <laughs> it's crazy so let's dig in i think you're going to enjoy this we'll do the uh, short intro and then right into the interview which is the best part of this i hope you enjoy it please let Welcome to this new program called Still Growing in Grace. I'm Michael Zanker, your host, and it's a thrill to be with you today. I hope you enjoy this new program as it digs into understanding God's love bigger and deeper than we've possibly ever explored. The panelists that typically join me are these four wonderful people coming from really different backgrounds. And I think you're going to enjoy the conversations. They're real, that's for sure. Let us know how this has gone. Tell us if it's been encouraging. If you're online on Facebook or on YouTube, share these, these videos. Share the GAN network with friends. We'd love to hear more from you. If you want to watch previous episodes, there is a YouTube channel where you can visit, and you'll see another link shortly. Also, if you want to help support this program and help get good news out in a really practical way, you can support in Canada or the U.S. You can see the link there. And you can also visit mikezenker.blog to find all the previous episodes and messages from Hope Fellowship, uh, we'd love to have you tune in and connect with us there. Today's program is a little different. We thought let's dig right into one of the toughest, most difficult topics when it comes to unlearning false concepts of who we think God is, including the false concepts we have of the love of God. Does it have limits? Is there uh, an end to his love and I grew up believing that there is a hell that has a fire that will hurt my physical body forever because I didn't say the right prayer or forgot to ask for forgiveness for one thing that's the mentality that's the mindset and as the discussion continues this is going to be a mini series by the way we're going to unpack a lot of the tentacles because there's a whole bunch of little tentacles connected to this topic of hell that we didn't know was connected. And we're hoping that as the series goes through, you're going to find answers and far better hope-filled perspectives on what the love of God is and what this hell thing could be. I hope you enjoy this series. All right. Uh, if last uh, time was a bit... Um, 
Ooh, what are we getting into? Uh, this time we're going to continue that. And uh, the topic of hell is a big one. And if you weren't with us last time, we started to unpack um, how we've grown to find a better, more hopeful perspective on what this concept of hell is and maybe unlearning what it is not anyway. And so each of us kind of walked through some of that. But I think Bill said something <laughs> kind of like, uh-oh, I- I'm going to let you lead with this because this is a brutal smack in the face teaser. So No, go. I know. Yeah, so I told everybody one of the topics we addressed during the last conversation and uh, several of you pointed to it is we no longer believe in this idea of eternal conscious torment or in a lot of circles is called ECT, right? And I, I think in general, the idea around ECT is this eternal, torturous, punitive, you know, hellfire and brimstone, Satan shoving pineapples up your rear end kind of experience, right? It's the the misery, the increasing ever uh, horrible pain and suffering without end, right? And we're all, that's kind of the the idea of hell. If you've ever seen Little Nicky, it's somewhere in that that regard. Probably not quite so much. Um, <laughs> however, however, I said I, I at the very end, I was like, I'm gonna give you the reason I actually believe in eternal conscious torment. Um, ECT. So I'm a wordy. And again, I think this is just another way of approaching things and being a little more maybe open handed with our language, mm-hmm. Gumby like, you know, flexible with how we hear that. other people and not being so abrasive to just reject a term on its surface. So I'm just going to break the three words down eternal, everlasting, unchanging, forever. I'm okay with God being eternal and We'll just leave it at God's whatever this experience is and however it's focused in its intent is forever lasting, eternal. We're all good, right? Conscious. Conscious means I am, right? I I, I have a concept of self-being, and I believe that is of God himself. God is I am that I am, or maybe more appropriately, I will be that I will be. I am an extension. I am I am sourced in my consciousness from I am. So if there's consciousness involved in this eternal experience, then it has to be of God and by God, with God and for God, right? So it's a conscious experience. I'm aware. And in my awareness, God has to be involved because God's my awareness is a subset of God's awareness. Hmm. Then we get to the last word, torment. Right. And this is the one that gets people uncomfortable because we associate torment with torture. Uh-huh. And these are actually two very different words. Torture is punishment for the sake of pain and suffering to inflict, you know, punitively as 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 in, you know, we're going to take a pound of flesh for the pound of flesh that you you took. Torment in the Greek is a different word. It's the word um, um, tor- touchstone. Touchstone. That's ba- the word. Basinos, I think. Of bas- yeah, basinos. And it, its idea was to take a precious metal and you would rub it and grind it and, and abrasively, you know, try to figure out the purity of the metal. And if the metal wasn't pure, you threw it back into a heating pot, you melted it down, you let the impurities rise to the top, you pulled off the impurities, you let it resolidify, and then you touchstone it, you torment it, and you friction, you but you're trying to see are we getting to the purest essence of what this precious thing could be. And when we think about eternal conscious and torment in that word, I'm a full believer in God's desire to continue to purify us through this repetitive process, scraping away our impurities, bringing us up to the level of his desire to see us as the most precious item that he owns. It's beautiful. I don't think that sounds too bad. No, now you're giving context. That helps. Like, unfortunately, most of us have grown up in a church system where you can't question anything because you signed a document. If you're a member, you can't question doctrines. You signed on that line. And if you screw up once you're out, and especially for pastors. So yeah. 
if I had to re-sign stuff today, I would not. I'd be editing yeah. and editing and scratching <laughs> out. Nope, nope, nope. Um, but unfortunately, there are many believers who are hungry for more. They know there's better news and a, there's got to be a better way to understand it because it, right. they're asking. That's that's why we're having this conversation. So th- give- there you go. That's what, I'll give you my reason that I can, at least on a surface level, have a conversation with somebody and at least begin a dialogue. And I think so much of what we're going to talk about over the next several episodes, if you're interested in where we're taking this conversation, having that open heartedness and not just being a blockade to language or some sort of the word hell or the word ZCT. I mean, there is a, there is a a garden. There is a garden of goodness that we can enter in if we don't hold the dogmatism. Yeah. Open-handed. Let the Lord put in or take out what should be there or shouldn't be. That has helped me in all of my theology journey now, Mm -hmm. including my pastoral work. It's not my church. Lord, put in, take out. If it folds, it's your fault. If it grows, it's your fault. Like that comes to this theology too, Lord. What part of this topic am I not getting or seeing? And do I have to be right about it? Maybe it's not about being right. Maybe it's about expanding our understanding and realizing there's more menu items than we've ever been told. Well, I, uh, I'll, I'll go with uh, this for me. We start with, the, our, in our previous episode, we started with the character of God mm-hmm. and we were tying it in with um, um, correction. So as a kid, one of the uh, growing up in church where Mike, you, you mentioned earlier last episode that you, you, you heard a great message about the love of God. And I, I'm just being honest. I never remember hearing mm. messages about the love of God. I'm sure they did, but they didn't rise to the level of memory. It was the, the fear that did. Um, but God is love and God is a consuming fire. And if we put those together, God is a loving consuming fire. And I like what uh, Mike just said, because Revelation is one of those verses that people talk about. And, you know, they, they toss them into this lake of fire. Uh, Richard does a great job with the oxymoron of that in his his writings. But I, I like this idea. Torment is a word of a, of a touchstone in a comparison of, of metals. But it, it's tied with it's you're tormented in fire and brimstone or sulfur. And that word is also a purifying word, a word yes. that means it was a, you know, to use to fumigate and to, to, to clean away infections or to, to, to protect against those things. So um, those are beginning to be a different way to look at this whole concept of what's taking place in uh, the next life when God does his corrective work. You know, um, the bur- um, fear has torment to get mm-hmm. that word. When you were talking about torment, I was saying fear has torment. I want to be something if what, what Bill was describing and what this whole process is, is to eliminate fear. Yeah. In, in other words, that gets ground out of us is not some, you know, like in this thing or that thing, it's mm-hmm. fear. And, and Hebrews 2 says that fear is what has allowed the dark powers, Satan, he through he operates through fear and through our fear of death. So again, I think hell on a on a delusional perspective is our fear of death. Mm. All right. So God comes and He grinds the fear out of us with love, with with the fire of love. And it's not that we should fear His punishments; it's that we should l- long for His for His correction because His correction. It's fear removing, it's oppression removing, and it's, it takes us to where everyone wants to go. But because we believe lies about his nature, we're not willing to let him, we're not willing to take him there. But even that is part of what gets ground out. That's fear based. Hell, as it's taught, as y'all shared, it's fear based. If it's fear based, it's wrong. And there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has lodestone. to do with punishment. Yes, exactly. Which is the next and, and, Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that that's, if, if we could just get to the point where we can look forward to this process, you know, where we can see this is a beneficial process. It's a glorious process. It's a form of sanctification. I mean, I think it's synonymous with sanctification, except I do think 
that, um, you know, the word judgment comes from a word crisis and from which we get the word crisis. So it is, I think there is an elevated, you know, when our souls leave our bodies, wherever this post-mortem thing happens, all right, that it is an elevated, you know, sort of a, a, a Dickinson, Dick, uh, Dickinson, Dickinsonian uh, Christmas Carol type of thing where like yeah. Scrooge, we're taken on a journey. You know, and who knows what that's like? We 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 say it's many. It's a little bit like Scrooge, but I mean, e even look at Jonah. You know, Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days, and in there he said, "I'm in hell. I'm in shale, and mm -hmm. I'm here forever. I've been here forever." But how long had he only been there? Three days. And did he come out a wiser person? Yes. Dan Smiley. So I mean, it, it, it's just uh, you know, again, hell is fear based, and if if, if the, the Lord wants to deal with our fears. I mean, I'm just so, so convinced of that. And if we, you know, as we, as we, I don't even want to say conquer fear because that's, that's an arrogant thing to say, but as fear has less and less hold on us, then, then hell, the reality of all this just starts aligning into, into a peaceable place, you know, and that this is a good thing and that God is good and he would never take us to any place that doesn't lead us to goodness. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, I mean, that, that's, uh, and that's a that, exciting that's thing. And, and and dealing with these issues is part of the grinding, Bill. I mean, you know, we're, we're grinding ourselves as we're talking about this. That's so it. this is this is about trust as well. Like if if we're told do not fear, do not fear, do not fear, there's a reason for it. And to trust or believe um, that if we trust God is good, then we can go through the purge, right? Like I think when we, cross, when we cross the other side, I think there's going to be a jaw-dropping moment of... What? This is not what I expected. Mm -hmm. And all of our worries about what we're going to tell God will disintegrate and we're going to be in awe of what is new. And he changes our mind as we're crossing over, however that works. I've heard way too many stories on that. Richard, you uh, you used the word uh, uh, good. You said, you know, God, God is good in, uh, in reference to the, this concept, this hellish concept. And uh, uh, there's a, there's a scripture and it's in Mark chapter nine and it says something along the lines of uh, Jesus speaking. He said, uh, we, everybody's going to be salted with fire. And he goes on and he says, and it's good. This is a good thing. <laughs> Salt <laughs> with fire, and it's a good thing. We don't, we don't ever think of the concept of, you know, hellish fire as being good, but that's what Jesus said uh, that this is a good thing. And what really everything that I'm hearing today is what everybody's saying is that this fire, this and so on, and fire is just a metaphor, but this thing, this thing that is going to uh, people will experience, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It leads it leads to something to something better, to a better me, to a better person here. I think and there's I, an uh, yeah, there's an element too culturally as. 21st century, you know, human beings, we, we have, I think, a natural fear of fire and, and rightly so. Um, but to some degree, because we've harnessed it in such a different way than maybe people who read and experienced the scriptures more from a primitive standpoint would have. And the reality is fire, just from the raw anthropo anthropological standpoint to humanity is one of the elements that separates us from animals and our ability to even just begin to harness this concept of fire. Fire is what allows us and our digestive systems to process meat in a much more effective, efficient way. Fire is what allowed us to purify things that were diseased and we could purge them from our society. Fire is the thing that allowed us to have heat and get into areas of the world that we couldn't explore before because all of a sudden we could have warmth and we could we could survive in a moment we couldn't and and I think we 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 are we don't have the association with fire today that maybe people of that time would have associated with it more I mean fire was dangerous it would burn them it could burn down an entire village it could have a massively powerful negative effect but the positive attributes it brought to their societies was overwhelming. It really was. And so when we talk about fire being good, we, I think, we associate it with, we touch stove, stove's hot. But when we think about just heat and fire and light, 
and actually what benefits they bring and how far outweighing the, the negative they are, it's kind of, it's kind of mind blowing. Another cultural aspect was that the Eastern language at that time was in, incredibly vivid. And so um, that's the way they talk. So Jesus yeah. would say things like, if you follow me, you have to hate your mother and father. Mm -hmm. right. Nobody, we, we wouldn't say that today, anything like it. He would say to the and Pharisees. And nobody believes that Jesus actually meant that. <laughs> like yeah, right, right. That. <laughs> but it, it, was, it was the type, the, the Aramaic language. Uh, it, this was the way they talked and it, yeah. it certainly did get attention. He would say to the Pharisees, you, you know, you brood of vipers, you whitewash tombs. That's not very nice. Uh, but again, it, if we understand some of that language from that time, they did that speak in vivid terms. So everybody being salted with fire is good. And, and, the, and the fire language of revelation and all of that. And the second real quick, uh, when I share with our people about judgment and, and meeting with God, the, the two pictures I want them to have is the father, but also a great physician. Because every time you go to the doctor, you go there for judgment. Yep. So the doctor has judged me on here recently. Uh, he's judged <laughs> me uh, on some things, but it's for my good. And um, it is for my benefit. And some of it is a little tough to hear, but um the the right kind of doctor the good doctor <laughs> says it with a compassion a love and a care for you and you want it you want to go see him or her you want to have them speak into you and uh i just tell our people that's who we're going to face as a loving father and a great physician mm. i think um uh, here's a couple of good quotes from the early church fathers on this i think they saw it the exact same way clement of alexandria said this he said, fire is conceived of as a beneficent and strong power, destroying what is base, preserving what is good. Therefore, this fire is called wise by the prophet. Mm -hmm. We say that the fire purifies not the flesh, but sinful souls, not an all devouring, vulgar, earthly, natural fire, but the wise, the wise fire was what we call it, the fire that pierces the soul, which passes through it. And then Origen said, uh, the, the uh, sacred scripture does indeed call our God a consuming fire and says that rivers of fire go before his face and that he shall become as a refiner's fire and purify the people, Malachi 3, 2. And therefore, God is a consuming fire. What is that to be consumed by him? We say it is wickedness and whatever proceeds from it, such as figuratively is called wood, hay and stubble in 1 Corinthians 3, which we read the last time, which denote the evil works of humanity. Our God is a consuming fire in this sense, and he shall come as a refiner's fire to purify rational nature from the alloy of wickedness and mm -hmm. other impure matter, which has adulterated the intellectual gold and silver, consuming whatever evil is admixed in all the soul. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've got a ton of these where they talk about fire that way, you know, so. But I, the I average, how, how many, again, we've. We got five people at least. Four of us grew up in church, or at least three of us at the, you know, <laughs> grew up grew up in church. I never heard that one time. I didn't hear anything about the positive side. <laughs> you know, you know, uh I, I had uh, a daydream about a week ago, and in this daydream, I was just thinking on, on the on on the post mortem journey, and I just let my thoughts go and go down this daydream, and in the daydream. I could see um, the first thing I saw was people that I had wronged and people that I had wronged, whether I knew about it, I knew about some of them I'd already wronged, but I didn't know about all of them I had wronged. And then as I passed by them, it's, it's like I could feel the pain that I caused them. I could feel it and it was staggering, but they each told me they forgave me. Mm -hmm. You know, I would feel the pain and then they would tell me, they would smile at me and hug me and tell me they forgave me. And then when I got to the end of it, there was a second line. And the second line of people behind them were the ones that had hurt me. And then as I saw them, I realized that my place in the line was to tell them I forgive them. Um, which if, if that line had been first, I don't know that I could have done it. You know, uh, I had to say to myself, but because I felt the forgiveness of all, all these that I had hurt, then I turned around, I was able to do the same thing. That, now, that's just a, a metaphor. 
But I felt like, man, I could, I could, I can visualize that. I can mm-hmm. see that. If we go there and we receive the forgiveness, then we turn around and we can forgive. And um, wouldn't it be neat if it was something like that? Hmm. I think the uh, whole idea of forgiveness plays a major role in in how we unload and unpack this topic because um, if you if you misunderstand what forgiveness is there because there is a number of misunderstandings um, then your concept of God is woven into that so is your concept of hell and as you begin to understand what, what we're talking about today, uh, that what is, what is judgment and what could the fire actually be uh, for its purpose? Maybe God's better than we've been told. Maybe there's a glimmer of light. Maybe there's some more avenues that we're still having to walk down here and unpack this because I want to get into the words, the actual words we're going to be dealing with, but I think we're going to do that next time. I don't think there's time today. I want to unpack our misunderstanding of the fire and the judgment because we got about five minutes left or three minutes, four minutes left. So uh, I want to kind of hit that. And I think, Fred, that's where you're trying to go to, I think. Well, yeah, maybe I, uh, Richard's. Uh, Do a course stream, correction then. Uh, well, well, Richard's stream, I think what I had mentioned earlier, I think that uh, psychologists refer to empathy as God's behavioral modification. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I do think that um, part of the correction and judgment is to allow us to be in the shoes of those whom we have hurt. So if, if you take a, you know, the, the biggest case, like a, a Hitler, um, he, however long it takes, he, does he indeed have to face every child, every mother, every father, every, and hear the pain. And eventually that, the, the, you know, all of his, you know, talking about destroying body and soul in, in Gehenna fire. Well, his life his purposes, his reputation, his desires, his goals are all beginning to change and shift as he's placed in uh, a situation where he's beginning to empathize with those who whom he's hurt. And I, I think that that leads to great correction, even in our uh, justice system here from time to time. Uh, well, it, it, in most cases of murder, uh, victims have a chance to speak. And the uh, Richard, you obviously could speak more to this than I, but, uh, you know, a person will have to sit there and listen to the pain that's been caused. And you can see that people respond differently. Uh, the perpetrators, some of them don't seem to care. They're very callous and cold. But others of them, you can see that it's beginning to impact them. They didn't think about that. And I do think God, in his perfection and wisdom, has a way of using empathy to bring about correction uh, in uh, our lives in the next age to come, however long that that takes as we work through forgiveness and the pain we've caused others and others have caused us. What if that processing is a sign of what the fire of purification can be where for somebody still in their anger, if they're testifying about what's happened to them as a way of saying, here's how it's affected me, they may be angry. They might be speaking from a place of mercy, but if they're angry, um, that may be the, the beginning. And they're, they have much farther to go. There's more fire, more refining that has to happen. But those that have come to a place of forgiveness already, they're already open to receiving and giving a little more mercy. Um, I've had, uh, we, we don't have time for the stories, but this, it's just yeah. too big of a topic. And I think there's more good news. We got one more minute. Who wants to wrap up? So I, I'll do it because I, I, this is my favorite part is to just <laughs> set the tease for the next time. Oh. If we're going to have a good TV show, you got to have it. We got to have just the giant tease just hanging out there. I left the last one. <laughs> so Mike, you mentioned it. We're, we'll, I think it will be good to go through the different verbiages of what hell is technically in the scriptures because that has a tremendous amount of value. The one question I love to ask, and I think it's good to just leave it hanging because this is one that I've used when I've been in these conversations that I think get somewhere with people who have even just the crack opened to exploring this conversation. But who are the people most susceptible, according to Jesus, of going to hell? (laughs) Great. I'm glad we'll cover that next time. (laughs) I love it. Well, thanks guys for that conversation. Um, This is a deep one. I hope that if you're watching, this is encouraging to you. And I hope you'll join us next time on Still Growing in Grace. 
Okay, how would you like that uh, introduction to this topic called hell? Uh, I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hello to those watching online, Cynthia from the UK and Danny uh, Jr. Uh, Felicia, now I, you're watching from YouTube, Felicia, so I don't know which Felicia this is. Uh, if it's the one that's connected to Open Table, let me know. Um, but that's cool. Um, so this was just the intro, and Bill... Bill, seriously, what a tagline at the end, why he actually believes in eternal conscious torment. That's a teaser, okay? It's called bait. It's it's, it's a clickbait in a sense. You, you, you got to watch next week's because he, he does a brilliant job explaining what he means and it's not what you think. So <laughs> I love it. Anyway, we are going to unpack this thing because if these tentacles attach to hell... Uh, are preventing us from understanding the goodness of God, then these tentacles have to be detached. Um, anything that is not true needs to be detached anyway. And so I think this is, this is great. I'd rather have uh, untruths purged from my thinking and have it replaced with truth or enlarge the truth within me to push out those false concepts. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. Hopefully you'll enjoy the series. So this is part one of a number of them so let's just enjoy and we'll look forward to seeing you next week and if you want to watch on the gan network grace awakening network look at the links below and you'll see them there thanks for watching and we'll catch you next time join me next time on still growing in grace enjoy previous episodes by downloading our podcast at growingingrace.ca if this show has been an encouragement to you consider making a donation today for our canadian link visit growingingrace.ca and for our usa link visit eschurch.com your donation will help us continue spreading really good news thank you again for tuning in to still growing in grace